Um, we're going to start up this next session on um, oral session 3.2b on face and body. Um, I'm the session chair, Simon Lucy. And again, if you have any speakers that are in the audience, please come up. Um, we have um, special seating allocated for you. Um, so we're gonna, gonna start the session, and as per usual, it's gonna be in lots of threes, there's gonna be question time in between, so if you guys have great questions, please come up and um, ask your wonderful questions. And a reminder too that at the end of the session, at a courtesy to the speakers for the last three, please stay seated until the question time is finished so that people have the opportunity to ask questions. Okay, all right, so we're gonna start with our, our first lot of speakers. All right, cool. So before the video actually gets started, so I have uh, more time to do my talk. Um, so I'm going to be introducing my paper today called High Quality Face Capture Using Anatomical Muscles. Uh, my name is Michael Bao, and uh, I, along with my co-authors, we're from Industrial Light and Magic, or we have affiliation with Industrial Light and Magic. So the goal of our paper is to use facial anatomical muscle simulation for visual effects. So actually a funny story, uh, one of my co-authors from a few, uh, he came to CVPR a couple years ago and he was talking to some people and he mentioned that he's from Industrial Light and Magic. And one of the questions that he got was, oh, Industrial Light and Magic, so you guys make movies, why do you guys need computer vision? So, uh, because generally you think of movies and you think of explosions, you think of the dinosaurs, but you don't realize how much computer vision is actually involved in the creation of movies. And then one particular aspect of uh, computer vision and this mix of computer vision and computer graphics that is really relevant for movies nowadays is in the creation of faces, digital faces for movies. Um, one of the more recent examples of this is General Tarkin in Rogue One. I'll note that we did not cooperate or collaborate with Lucasfilm for this, uh, for the lawyers. And this is a hard problem to do right. Um, there's things from computer graphics that we need to use, such as the deformation model, physically-based rendering, things from computer vision, uh, capturing the data, calibrating cameras, whatever, and then we have to combine the two. We have to figure out how do we get this 3D model to perfectly fit into this 2D image that, such that it looks perfect for the viewers on the big screen when, uh, when people go to view this movie in movie theaters. And really, this is a really involved process and it's a hard problem. And the reason why it's so hard is because of this thing called the uncanny valley. So this is a psychological response to faces that look real but not quite real. And the, the reason why it's so hard is that we do not know what causes the uncanny valley. So it's a hard problem to quantify. Uh, and generally, the problem is worse for moving faces. And therefore, in my research, we want to focus on um, the deformation model, aka how do we get this 3D model to move in a way such that it looks realistic. And the major way that's commonly being used nowadays to do this is to use blend shape models. So if you're familiar with uh, computer vision, you may have heard of like 3D morphing models, and that's like a very traditional blend shape model. And the problem with these kind of models is that they are generally, the parameter space permitted, permitted by these, uh, these models are really large, and a, lot, a good portion of that uh, parameter space is unrealistic. Uh, so we want to be able to try to use physical simulation to uh, create more realistic uh, sim uh, animations. So the first work that did use muscle simulation was by Sifakis et al. in 2005. Uh, this is some early work that used muscle simulations to target mocap data. And while it worked, uh, it was a good first example. The problem with this sort of method is that a pure muscle activations-based model is not very expressive, and you, you still are very much in the depths of the uncanny valley. Um, in 2016, uh, Kong et al. introduced a paper that introduced this concept of muscle tracks, which introduced a, a less anatomically motivated but uh, still physical uh, force into the quasi-static simulation to allow for more expressive simulation. It's great, but it's not uh, obviously differentiable or parameterized, and therefore it's hard to use for vision problems. So in our particular paper, we introduced what we call muscle uh, blend-shape-driven muscle tracks, which combines the idea of muscle tracks introduced by Kong Al in 2016 with the more traditional blend-shape models. And this allows us to have a fully differentiable model while still maintaining the expressiveness of the muscle tracks. And additionally, we also can show that this is uh, more or less mathematically equivalent to the muscle tracks of Kong et al. And so we will show uh, in a number of examples that uh, our model uh, pretty much produces geometric results that are nearly identical to the blend shape model while still preserving volume and introducing some physical properties that are hard to get using a blend shape model. And we target uh, geometry, we target RGB images using a differentiable render, and just, we just show that we can use this in any sort of Jacobian-based optimization. And 
yeah, if you want to see these videos, I can show these videos to you on my laptop at the poster session. So uh, in the end, we introduced a fully expressive, fully differentiable muscle simulation model. Uh, we can use this in any optimization problem. Um, these activations are sparse and can be used uh, probably for interpretation and, and, and learning, hopefully. Uh, and we want to also be able to create better models. We want to be able to calibrate models for humans uh, in the future. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we are running optimization problems. So we will uh, hopefully want to be able to uh, create better, better, uh, better cost functions and energy functions so that we can uh, solve this problem better in the future. Uh, and that's my talk, so thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Ayush, and I will talk about learning face models from videos. So we want to compute monocular 3D reconstruction, so we only have single monocular RGB images, and we want to compute the 3D reconstruction. And the 3D face uh, includes information about the geometry as well as the appearance of the face. Um, now, this is a very ill-posed problem uh, because of the depth ambiguities, of course, but also there are ambiguities between uh, the geometry as, and the appearance components of the reconstruction. So parametric face models are used to constrain this ill post problem, and these parametric models include identity geometry and reflectance, as well as expression models, and we also uh, have seen information which is usually represented using some illumination and post parameters. So in this work, we focus on building the identity components of uh, these parametric models. So uh, the current techniques to compute these models require 3D scans. And uh, since it is quite expensive and difficult to capture a large 3D data set, these models do not generalize very well across different identities, especially in challenging cases such as the presence of facial hair. A lot of monocular reconstruction approaches have been proposed using these parametric models, uh, but, but as you can expect, these approaches also don't work very well on in-the-wild images, mostly due to the limitations of the parametric models. In this work, we propose to learn such 3D models of faces, but just from videos without the need for any 3D scans. So videos are widely available online. We have large data sets of videos, and thus we can expect such models to generalize much better compared to the models which uh, are computed from 3D data. And in addition, we uh, jointly learn to reconstruct monocular images as well. So our approach is based on some multi-frame constraints. So first of all, we assume that the skin reflectance of a person would remain consistent across all frames of a video. However, the geometry uh, needs to be decomposed into two components. There's an identity component, which again will be consistent throughout the video, but the expressions will be different for each frame of the video. So based on these constraints, uh, we have a learning-based approach, which takes multiple frames of a video as input during training. Then we have a shared network, which takes these frames and gives us consistent identity-specific shape and appearance parameters. So this enforces the multi-frame constraints by design. Once we have these parameters, these are used as input for our learnable parametric face model. Then we also have uh, frame-specific parameters, as I said. For example, pose, expression, and illumination, which is different for each frame. And these are estimated using uh, per frame using Siamese networks. Once we have our reconstruction here, we use a differentiable rendering module to project the reconstructions back onto the image plane. And finally, once we have uh, the, the renderings, our loss function evaluates the photometric consistency between the input frames of the video and the reconstructions. So this is like a model-based autoencoder. So we do not need any 3D supervision to train our networks. It's all just videos. Here you can see some of the results. We can uh, separate the different components of our reconstruction even in the presence of beards and makeup. 
we can estimate the skin reflectance up to a global scale factor. We can also reconstruct video sequences like these you see here. Uh, we obtain temporally coherent results and uh, our approach works well even in large poses. Our approach also is quite fast, running at about 200 frames per second on a Titan Pascal GPU. We compare to several model-based reconstruction approaches, um, and we show that learning from videos helps us generalize better, and we also obtain more accurate results in uh, comparison to these approaches. For more details, please come to our poster. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Xiao Zhang from CUHK. I'm here to present our work on designing a novel loss function for training face recognition models. Here's the face recognition pipeline. Models are trained with soft max loss and inner products during training. However, during testing, we wanted to use angular distance to determine similarities between face images. So there is a large gap between inner product in training and cosine similarity in testing. In recent face recognition methods during training, cosine distance between face features and the class widths are calculated to measure their similarities. One hyperparameter S is manually set to scale's greatest length, while margin hyperparameter M is manually set to enlarge class margins. But we still have two problems in these angular losses. First, there is no theoretical guidance for setting uh, the hyperparameters, and the second, the final performance greatly depends on hyperparameter setting. Uh, based on the hyperparameter S and uh, uh, M, and the cosine similarities between features and the class weights, the Conventional softmax loss first obtain probabilities of phase I belongs to the class G and then compute the loss values. We observe that the angles between phase and their corresponding ground truth classes, theta I, Y, I, are more important for training, which is the blue curves here. And they gradually decrease during training while other angles almost always remain half a pi. Based on such observation, we investigate the influence of hyperparameter S, where the different S values affect the ground truth classification probabilities and eventually influence the final loss. Importantly, for different class numbers, S even should be set differently, which is very inconvenient. Uh, hyperparameter M has a similar effect and it also influenced by different class numbers, which again make it difficult to turn for different data sites. So in summary, hyperparameter S and M can both influence classification probabilities and the final loss. We propose an adaptive hyperparameter to replace them in our loss function. In our ad cost loss function, we use only hyperparameter S and make it adaptive to current training status. As shown in this figure, we hope the curve of probability increased from 0 to 1 as the ground truth cl class angle decreased from half a pi to 0, give a desired center angle set 0, and we can calculate its corresponding hyperparameter S0 to achieve such a desired curve. In our first exploration, uh, a quarter path seems to be a proper choice for theta zero when the angles span between zero and half a pi. The corresponding fixed scale in our ad course is adapted to different class numbers, but it fixed uh, during the training process here. But uh, in, however, the angles be, uh, of training samples changes during training. Uh, they are largely in the beginning and become smaller over time. We therefore also make the center angles to gradually decrease over time according to the angle statistic of many batches of training samples. 
Well, the blue curve shows the changing process of the proposed adaptive hyperparameter S in our at cost loss function. The scaled parameter gradually shrinking during the training according to current training process. Here we uh, have some experiment to show the effectiveness of at cosine. We evaluated in here in three different protocols. We use FLFW as a small evaluation data set. In this left figure, ad cost can achieve smaller angles between feature and their core responding class weights. In larger evaluations, such as mega phase one million identification challenge and IGBC phase verification task, dynamic ad cost can still perform competitive results. So eventually we have two conclusions. First, the hyperparameters in angular losses can be unified into a single adaptive parameters. Secondly, the proposed, the proposed ad cosine can adaptively scale log, log it according to the current progress and optimally balance the convergence and the performance. Please visit poster number 94 for more discussion. Thank you. Okay, so we have our first Q&A session. So if you have any questions, we have microphones on either side. And also, if there are any speakers in the audience who have not approached the chairs here, please come and take your position. Um, yeah. Any questions? Oh, we have a question here. Hi, Ayush. I have a question. Very nice work. I just didn't really get the details. Um, do you actually update your blend shapes that you learn from video? And that what kind of difference do you get from that? Uh, no, we do not. So the blend shape model, the expression model is completely fixed. We are only trying to learn the identity component of the model. So the geometric deformations, which correspond to neutral expression deformations across different people. I see. I guess you could always you know, back prop through to those. I guess you haven't done that. You, you, you could. Uh, yeah. It's not as trivial because then you, it's, it's not that trivial to separate the deformations which are uh, there due to expressions or due to identity. So if you fix one of these models, it is easy to separate it into the two components, see, but not otherwise. Okay, and why do you think it's so stable over time even though it's frame by frame? Um, that's Your intuition it. on it, I'm asking. Yes, I think it's because so the, the network finds good correspondences over images during the training data set, and that's why it is stable, and I think a, a lot of reason, a lot of credit for that also goes to, we use a key point uh, error, and I think the key points are also very stable across images, and that also helps a lot okay. to, for the stable reconstruction. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, I have a question for uh, the people that are doing uh, 3D modeling here. So um, how, how accurate does the 3D model need to be in your experience? How, what? how accurate? What's the, should we try to make them as accurate as possible, or is there a, a golden point where that's enough? Uh, generally, at least for visual effects, our interest are, is in high quality. So, uh, so generally, we want our models to be as actor-specific as possible. So we actually spend a lot of time doing model creation. and. We generally do find if we compare the results of facial tracking using our actor-specific model versus like a more generic model, like um, like the basal face model, for example, we do get better results, uh, better fitting using the uh, actor-specific model. So uh, we, we do spend a lot of time doing uh, shape tweaks and, and model tweaks to, to get better fits. So we do, we do find having a very uh, high quality model helps a lot. Yeah, I, I have similar opinion. So I think uh, with the generic model currently, the results are not as impressive in terms of quality, but it would be very interesting to see how far we can push it. Let's thank the speakers. Hello, everyone. I am Liu Hauke from Nanyang Technological University. Today I will present our work 3D hand shape and post estimation from a single RGB image. Most existing RGB-based methods focus on estimating 2D and 3D locations of hand joints, which cannot fully express the 3D hand shape. However, many imp immersive VR and AR applications often require accurate estimation of both 3D hand pose and shape to motivate 
to, to motivate us, uh, this motivates us to bring out a more challenging task, how to jointly estimate the 3D hand-drawn locations, as well as the full 3D hand mesh from a single RGB image. To achieve this goal, there are several challenges. The first challenge is the high dimensional output space of 3D hand mesh. In this paper, we propose a lower graph neural network based method to generate 3D hand mesh as a graph. The second challenge is the task of 3D hand mesh training data, um, is the lack of 3D hand mesh training data for real world images. To solve this problem, we create a large scale synthetic RGB based 3D hand shape data set. To, uh, to find uh, to our model on real world data sets, we propose a lower weakly supervised method by leveraging the depth map as a weak supervision. Most previous methods estimate 3D hand mesh from depth images by fitting a deformable hand model to the input depth map. A recent work estimates 3D hand shape from depth images. For RGB based methods, many recent works estimate 3D hand posts using convolutional neural networks. In this year's APR, some works estimate 3D hand shape parameters from RGB images. However, our work directly generates 3D hand mesh using a graph neural network. We first create a large scale synthetic hand shape and post data set. It provides the annotations of both 3D hand joint locations and full 3D hand meshes. <coughs> the synthetic RGB image is rendered by a 3D hand model with, an, uh, with natural lighting and realistic background. As shown in this figure, the input RGB image is passed through an hourglass network to infer 2D heat maps of hand joints. The 2D heat maps combined with the image feature maps are encoded as a latent feature vector using a residue network. The encoded latent feature is the input to a graph neural network to infer the 3D coordinates of hand mesh vertexes. The 3D hand joint locations are then regressed from the 3D hand mesh. In this work, we adopt Chebyshev special graph neural networks to generate 3D hand mesh. A 3D hand mesh can be represented by an undirected graph. The topology of the hand mesh is predefined. Thus, we can use graph neural networks to predict 3D locations of mesh, mesh vertexes. We design a hierarchical ar architecture for mesh generation by performing graph convolutions on, gra on graphs from coarse to fine. We first train the network on our synthetic data set and then fine tune it on real world data sets. On synthetic data set, we train the networks end to end in a fully supervised manner by using 2D heat map loss, 3D mesh loss, and 3D post loss. On real world data set, the network is fine tuned in a weakly supervised manner. We leverage the corresponding depth map as a weak supervision and employ a differentiable render to render the 3D mesh to a depth map. In experiments, we evaluate the performance of 3D hand mesh reconstruction and 3D hand post estimation. We first evaluate the impact of different losses used in the fully supervised training. The model training with the full loss achieves the best performance in both mesh reconstruction and post estimation tasks. We conduct self comparisons and find that our 3D hand mesh generation method can also benefit to the 3D hand post estimation, especially in the case without 3D hand post separation. We also compare our method with some state of the art methods on two public data sets. Finally, we present some qualitative results of 3D hand mesh reconstruction and 3D hand post estimation on our data set and public data sets. This is a video for hand shape and post estimation on continuous image sequences. Thank you. Please visit our poster at number 95. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Adnan, and this is my work entitled 3D Hand Shape and Pose from Images in the Wild. Uh, it was in collaboration with Rodrigo and Phil, uh, that you obviously know. So uh, we tackled the problem of 3D hand reconstruction from a single color image, and this problem is of interest to uh, virtual and augmented reality applications and gesture-based machine interfaces. 
So we could argue that 3D hand reconstruction is harder than human bodies and faces. Hands have an almost spatially uniform albedo, unlike loaded bodies. Uh, they lack distinctive local features, like noses or eyes in faces. They can have a more complex pose configuration than bodies, and they can also be observed from a wider range of views. Besides, single view inputs imply scale and depth of ambiguities, unfortunately, in 3D. And images, images of hands in the wild can also come with self-occlusion, external occlusion, and clutter. Motion can cause images to be blurry also. And hands are often small in size compared to the scene, so uh, crops around them uh, have usually low resolution. So we propose to solve these uh, two sets of difficulties with the prowess of deep learning. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of training data. So uh, additionally, we relax heavy dependence on, on that data by regularizing the problem heavily with a, with a, with a hand shape and pose prior in the form of a, a differentiable hand model integrated with an end-to-end trainable network. So this is our method. Uh, the pipeline takes as input a hand image and optionally 2D joint heat maps from an independent CNN. Uh, a deep convolutional encoder then uh, generates the hand shape and pose parameters and the view parameters. The hand parameters are uh, fed to the hand model that generates the triangulated 3D mesh and its underlying 3D skeleton. The latter are reprojected into the image domain using a weak perspective camera model controlled by the view parameters. This network is trained end-to-end -end with a combination of 2D joints and 3D, uh, like weak 2D joint, let's call it weak uh, 2D joint annotation and, and full 3D joint supervision, a regularization on the hand parameters and view parameters, and the hand silhouette loss to refine shape estimations and speed up conversions. Uh, th this last loss, the, the mask loss, actually penalizes reprojected hand vertices that lie outside of the hand uh, area in a binary image mask. The hand model that we use is the recently published uh, MANO. It encodes shape and pose variation with principal component analysis on registered real hand scans and uses linear blend skinning with corrective blend shapes in order to uh, reduce artifacts of linear blend skinning like uh, overly smooth outputs and mesh collapse around joints. So we pre-train the encoder to ensure that the camera and hand parameters converge towards acceptable values, and we build a synthetic data set to do that. Uh, we basically sample geometries from the hand model, Mano, and use real appearances, uh, appearance examples provided by Romero et al., the authors of, of Mano, to create uh, photorealistic images of hands superimposed on random backgrounds. Uh, for our weak shape silhouette supervision, we need ground truth hand masks to be occlusion aware and uh, to only contain the hand and not other skin areas such as arms. Since common segmentation methods do not offer that, we generate our own masks using GrabCat segmentation by initializing the foreground background regions using uh, 2D annotations. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we create an initial foreground by drawing lines connecting joints, as you can see in red, uh, according to the hand skeleton hierarchy. Pixels inside triangles formed by joints that belong anatomically to the hand surface are also appended to the foreground region as well. The undecided area is defined in green as the uh, region within a fixed distance at most from the foreground, and then the remaining pixels are assigned to the initial background. So you can see the final segmentations at the end. Uh, these are our, some of our results uh, uh, obtained with our method on the MPI and New Zealand Sign Language benchmark of images in the wild. We know that our simple yet effective approach is the first to predict not only the 3D pose, but also shape estimations of hands from a single image, along with the, the, the excellent work that was presented just before us. Uh, we obtained state-of-the-art performance on 3D pose, on standard benchmarks, and also geometrically valid and plausible 3D reconstructions, as you can see in the images, um, without the need for uh, additional optimization, as it is the case in other works. Uh, please come to our poster if you have uh, more questions, and thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Chen De Wang from ETH Zurich. I'd like to present our work, Self-Supervised Hand Pose Estimation Through Training by Fitting. This is a joint work of my colleagues, Thomas Probst, Professor Luke Van Gogh from ETH Zurich, and Professor Angela Yeo from National University of Singapore. 
we consider the problem of uh, 3D hand pulse estimation, which is estimate the 3D coordinates of hand joints from single depth map. It has important applications in the human computer interaction, in the augmented reality, virtual reality, and also in the human robotics interactions. The hand pulse estimation method generally falls into two groups, the discriminative versus the generative. Discriminative method directly regress the hand pulse with constant inference time, and uh, <coughs> its accuracy can be improved with increased the number of data. However, it needs large number of training samples, and uh, getting the 3D annotations are quite expensive, and it's really unaware of how well the estimation is. Generative model, on the other hand, uh, follows an, an analysis, but estimation by analysis we, and uh, really no training data is really needed, and the results are always kinematically feasible. However, it cannot memorize the previous results and uh, utilize on top of them, and uh, the optimization can be, can sometimes be trapped on the local minimum during inference. So the question arises, can we bring the benefits from the both world together to have a method. So in this paper, we propose a self-supervised method without uh, any human labor to train the network. And uh, during inference, it's as simple as a discriminative model with constant inference time, but its accuracy can be improved with the increased number of training samples. And during training, we use differentiable renderer to enable some model fitting laws, so no human labor is really needed. To be specific, for the discriminative model, we use the 2D hourglass network, um, and uh, we follow the work of Equibar at last ECCV to integrate over the 2D heat maps and the 2D map and the depth map. And uh, for the generative model, we follow the previous work uh, of uh, Archimedes, Sinda et al., Chen et al., and uh, Kah et al. to approximate the hand surface with a set of uh, geometric primitives. We use a set of spheres in our work to enable a very efficient differentiable renderer, which can efficiently calculate the point to surface distance, while at the same time enable the 2D fully convolutional network architecture and also the efficient back propagation. And our model fitting loss is uh, very similar to the previous model tracking based method. And uh, we also use the multi-view consistency to candle with the self-occlusion. The only difference, the major difference here from the previous work is uh, we optimize over the network parameter instead of the post parameter. And here are some qualitative results from the, our self-supervised methods from some real-world data set. The left uh, most, the rightmost columns are the reconstructed sphere models. So for more quantitative results and more details, please come to our post at uh, number 97. Thank you. All right, so we have time for questions again. Um, we have microphones on either side. Uh, right, we have a question over here. Speakers. A question, a question for the second speaker. So how important is the, how important is the novel hand mesh loss uh, quantitatively? Uh, you mean the, the, silhouette, the silhouette loss? Or which loss did you say, sorry? Uh, the, hand, the hand mask loss. Oh, yeah, yeah. So honestly, uh, that, that one 
we notice that that one helps speed up the conversions. So at the end, we get the same numbers with or without it, but then we get it, we get the, like better numbers in, in, in fewer iterations if we use that. Like it speeds up the conversion of the model. But the final results honestly were the same, like with, with or without that. So the, 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 the motivation is mainly speed of conversions. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, this is a question for the first two papers on RGB images. Um, so would you, uh, do you think having a uh, appearance-based or photometric loss would help? And if so, how would your uh, model support it? So your, so your question is for the volumetric loss? Uh, Sorry. Well, photometric or uh, appearance-based loss. Okay. So for the photo, uh, for the photometric, now uh, you mean, for example, using some differentiable render to to um, map the uh, 3D hand mesh to the uh, RGB image. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it may be have. Yeah, but currently I just use the depth image to di uh, to render the 3D hand mesh to a depth map. Yeah, because the depth map uh, do not be affected by the the lighting or the texture. Yeah. So it would be more robust, yeah. Um, but maybe the, uh, if we do not have the depth image, uh, the RGB, uh, we can render it as a RGB image, yeah. But maybe it is more challenging, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so just to complement what my, my friend said. So is, is, uh, uh, we don't have an appearance model as we do for faces, so we can do that. And uh, yeah, it might help. Maybe if you formulate the thing in, into a shape from shading framework or something like what people do for faces, it, we might explore those directions, but it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speakers. Good afternoon. It is Jeff Li here. I'm presenting the paper called Post, Efficient Cloudy Scenes Post Estimation and a New Benchmark. It is my honor to introduce my co-authors. This work is in collaboration with Chan Wang, Hao Zhu, Yi Huan Mao, Hao Shu Fang, and my advisor, Ce Wu Lu. In the past few years, many progress has been made in the field of multi-person 2D post estimation. State of the art methods have, uh, have achieved the results over 75 MAP. However, 67% of images in MS Coco dataset has no overlap person. This suggests that the dataset is not much difficult and the accuracy is close to saturation. So we turn our focus to more challenging scenes, such as crowding. Our paper focused on human post estimation in crowded scenes. We propose a novel method to tackle the crowded problem of post estimation, and we connect a new data set to better evaluate algorithms in crowded scenes. For the first thing, we need to define the measurement of crowding. We named it crowd index. We calculate the ratio between target joint and interference joints in one bounding box, and average all bosses to obtain crowd index. With this definition, we find out that the performance of the state-of-the-art methods degrade as crowd index rises. Those highly crowded scenes remain quite challenging. These figures present the crowd index distribution of several datasets. While the other ones dominated by uncrowded images, our crowd post dataset has a near uniform distribution. So the first challenge is that Human, human detection fails in crowded scenes. And also, human detection method cannot deal with the situation of large overlap. For a given bounding box, it is hard to identify which person it belongs to. Moreover, there are always interference joints in one bounding box, and it is impossible to fully suppress them. To tackle the challenges of post estimation in crowded scenes, we propose a novel method. Here is our pipeline. 
In inference phase, JC as PPE receive human proposals and generates joint candidates. Then we utilize them to build a person joint graph. Finally, we associate joints with human proposals by solving the assignment problem in our graph model. During training phase, we use joint candidate loss to train SPPE. To take advantage of interference joints, we modify the loss function and propose a joint candidate SPPE to handle them. During training, our loss function will give less punishment to the interference joints, and while testing, JCS PPE generates multi-peak heat maps and predict joint candidates. Each SPPE with an detection input will generate joint candidates. And let's take the left hand as an example. We will project those outputs to the original image and cluster the key points that represent the same joints together. After clustering, the redundant joint candidates are deleted. We represent them as, a, as joint nodes and the human proposals as person nodes. From now on, our goal of estimating human poses in the crowd is transformed into solving the above person joint graph, maximizing the total ways. Here we present a matching procedure. The, the human proposals that cannot succeed in matching any key points will be deleted. This linear assignment problem for the sparse matrix can be solved in Owen square. Such computation complexity is the same as the conventional greedy NMS algorithms. Here are some qualitative results of our method. We test the results in different occlusion level. According to the crowd index, we divide the crowd post data set into three parts, easy, medium, and hard. Most of, most of the improvement of our method are gained in the median crowded cases. Those hard cases with high crowd index are still quite challenging. We hope future works can solve these hard cases well. Our code and models are available at AlphaPost now. Welcome to our poster for more deta technical details. Thank you very much for attention. Okay, it's time to focus. We are almost there. Hello, everyone. My name is Han Bill Zhu. So the goal of this research is to enable machines to understand nonverbal social communication. So during the communication, we humans send social signals to convey messages. These signals include verbal cues, such as words and language, and also non-verbal cues, including facial expressions and body gestures. So human communication is a form of exchanging these social signals each other. Now let's unwrap these signals along the time axis. Here, each column is a concatenation of different channels at each time instance. And let's consider how machines can understand this communication. One common direction is by representing the meaning of social signals by words, for example, smile in emotion recognition and talking in action, action classification. However, these approaches have clear limitations, especially Words cannot fully express the subtle meaning of social signals because words are in discrete space, while our target signals are in continuous and high dimensional spaces. In this paper, we present social signal prediction as a way to understand nonverbal communication. The goal is to train machines to predict a part of social signals by using other signals as input. We hypothesize that there should be clear correlations among those signals which machine can learn. Notably, this formulation is already very popular in NLP, for example, pre-trained word embedding. However, this approach is really hard to be applied for non-verbal signals because there is no data we can directly use. So we have collected a new 3D motion capture data set with more than 100 participants. We designed a social game named Haggling where two sellers 
and a buyer play. And using a multi-view system, we captured various channels of visual signals, including face, body, and hand motion. The goal of social signal prediction is to learn a function to predict the signal of a target individual. Since we captured the signals of all people during the interaction, we have ground truth. In this paper, we considered three example problems with baseline method, predicting speaking status, predicting social formation, and body gestures. The first example task is predicting speaking status. As example, as input, we consider a part of social signals, for example, facial expression and body motion of an individual, and predict a binary speaking status of a target person. We test the task with different input by using the target person's own body signals or by using communication partners' signals as input. By comparing the prediction performance with various input, we computationally verified that there exists clear correlation among these signals. For more details, please see our paper. The second task is predicting social formation. Uh, this is the view from the top, and we only consider their locations body, and face orientations. As input, we consider two people's signals and consider to, uh, the goal is to predict the target person's location and orientations. This is an example result. Uh, the red circle is the ground truth and the blue cube is our prediction. As the last example, we've performed body gesture prediction. In this particular result, we try to uh, predict all possible signals for the target person given other two people's signals as input. The red is the ground truth, and the blue is our prediction. Our prediction includes body gestures, facial expression, location, and speaking status. For more details, please visit our poster session. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Alp from Aerial AI, and I'll be presenting our work titled Holopose Holistic 3D Human Reconstruction in the Wild. Human pose estimation has recently progressed from 2D key point based to 3D surface based understanding. In the last CVPR, DancePose proposed dense UV coordinate regression, mapping human pixels to 3D surface of the human body. DancePose is accurate and robust in the wild, but does not provide a 3D reconstruction. On the other hand, parametric models relying on a simple model regress kinematic triangles from an image. Uh, these operate in 3D, however, the surface alignment quality is inferior with respect to DancePose. And in this work, we aim to have the best of the two worlds, and we aim for accurate, robust, and in-the-wild reconstruction of humans. We make true contribu three contributions in this direction. Firstly, we introduce a simple and effective angle regression strategy that ensures our pose predictions are anatomically plausible. Our problem is that when we're predicting joint angles from the image, implausible 3D joint configurations can still project correctly to 3D. To handle this, we introduce a new regression layer that constrains our angles to 3D pre predictions. So for each body joint, we constrain the regressed angle to be a weighted combination of representative pose expert angle values. Our angle regression layer outputs a softmax weighted combination of the resulting cluster centers uh, from a k-means operation. This is completely differentiable and ensures that the regressed angle remains in the convex hull of the angle experts. Our second contribution is a part-based model for parameter regression. This exploits the compositional nature of human pose estimation, making the prediction easier and invariant to occlusions. Our FCN first localizes all visible key points, then for each joint angle, we pull mid-level features at the set of relevant key point locations. For a given angle, every key point votes on all angle experts related to that angle. Our part-based angle regression aggregates the votes cast from all relevant and visible key points to all experts yielding the final prediction. Being part-based, this process guarantees translation invariance as well as robustness to occlusion and background changes. 
In the third contribution, we propose a refinement process that forces the model-based 3D geometry to agree with bottom-up predictions of other localization tasks. Feed-forward processing yields a plausible 3D reconstruction, but is not guaranteed to project correctly to the image. For instance, here we see that the knees and feet are not well aligned. Extending this further, we used, uh, however, a 2D FCN can localize the knees with much higher accuracy. So we trust the 2D FCN results more and penalize model parameters if their 3D reconstructions do not project well to bottom-up key point estimates. And we extend this further with a multi-task multi network with predictions for dance balls, 2D key points, and 3D key points. These predictions define a misalignment loss between the top-down 3D model predictions and the bottom-up pose estimates. We minimize this loss with respect to uh, theta and achieve large improvements in terms of alignment. Here we see an example like that. We quantify the improvement in terms of surface alignment accuracy on dance balls COCO data set. In red, we show the dance pose regression results, which serve as an upper bound. In blue, we evaluate the HMR baseline. And in green, we show that our part-based system uniformly outperforms HMR. And in purple, uh, we show that synergistic refinement further improves alignment accuracy. We observe a similar pattern in 3D pose estimation on the human 3.6 million data set. Part-based 3D reconstruction is significantly better than monolithic reconstruction, while synergistic refinement further improves the accuracy. In the bottom, we show qualitative results. We observe that HMR often misses intricate articulations of legs or hands. By contrast, our part-based reconstruction is often much better aligned and robust to occlusions, while the refinement process further improves the alignment results. <clears throat> In this video, we see results obtained by a two-stage system, relying on faster RCNN for detection and holopose for 3D reconstruction. We observe that our method can handle scenes with multiple persons, occluding each other. We also demonstrate that our system provides multiple byproducts, like surface normals, key points, and shading images. If you want to know more about our latest results in real-time monocular 3D reconstruction, please visit uh, arielai.com and uh, come to our poster at poster number 100 to see our real-time 30 FPS demo on a mobile device. Thank you. So we have time for questions, so if the speakers can come up. Also a quick shout out, um, if the speaker for the next paper, weekly supervised discovery of geometry aware representation for 3D human pose estimation, can please come up to the front. Um, that would be great. Yes. Hi, hi, Alpha. I have a question. Very nice work. I maybe missed it. Uh, what does it prevent the joints from bending in the wrong direction? What's the provision you have? Yeah. A post prior that. Yeah. So, we, for each joint, we apply k-means to find cluster centers. And let's say for the knee, this will only bend the right way. The cluster centers will be only made up of uh, representative joint angles that are bent in the right way. And then while predicting, we are enforcing that our predictions are within the convex hull of uh, representative angles. And then this is uh, learned on top of uh, 3D data, I guess. Yeah, yes, this is learned from a motion capture data set. I see. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, uh, I'll ask one. So uh, can you guys make some comments on uh, how much we should uh, trust your... Uh, uh, quantitative results, how good is the estimation uh, pipelines for and uh, the evaluation pipelines for this uh, for these papers? Should I or whoever wants to say something? Uh, so for my paper, we have evaluated uh, two uh, different tasks, one for 3D uh, pose estimation aspect of the problem, the other for the surface alignment aspect for the problem. Uh, so the problem with the surface alignment uh, measurement is that you don't evaluate uh, how well you're doing in 3D. So the surface alignment can be perfect, but the pose, estimated pose actually could be uh, completely wrong. 
similarly, uh, in human 3.6 3 million data set, uh, there are uh, little uh, amount of test samples, like two person, so it's very easy to overfit to the identities in that data set, so yeah. In my case, the right evaluation is to check how natural the output is. The problem is, uh, given the same input, human emotion can be very diverse. In our case, actually, we are enforcing that the results should be go to one particular mode, which is not actually correct. So evaluation is actually a big problem, which I don't have any good solution yet. Well, so in my case, um, our qualitative results can see the, uh, how our algorithm perform in this occlusion. So, uh, but uh, for the main part of the person, person pose, it is, uh, is, you can see the difference because the matrix on um, MS Coco is quite straight. So a tiny difference can make a lot of error. Yeah. Let's um, thank the speakers. My name is Queen Ling. Today I will present our work on discovery 3D geometry representation of human body with only 2D key point information as supervision signal. So first we began with the definition of the task. Uh, the target of 3D human pose estimation is to infer full 3D human pose by estimating 3D location of important body parts. By training a network with pair training data, most of matter can achieve state of the art results um, on a particular data size. But once we test the model on different environments, the performance are usually frustrating. So what's the reason behind this performance bottlenecks? We know that to infer 3D information from single 2D image is an ill pose problem, but what makes this task harder is the inter-data side variation among the different uh, collection environments like the viewpoints, appearances, poses, all of these things lead to large domain shift. Meanwhile, the availability of training data is also a problem. We can capture the accurate 3D annotations in constrained environments like indoor mock-up systems, but they cannot capture all subtle poses of human body in unconstrained environments. Then we may want to incorporate uh, in, uh, in internet images into network training since they have impressive diversity among every expert. However, it is costly to obtain 2.5D extra annotation in these images. So is there a way to learn a robust representation for human body without requiring extensive 3D annotation? The answer is yes. Actually, people have proposed several weekly supervised methods to learn the representation from synthetic data to multiple consistencies. This work provides very nice ideas and the result results are really impressive. However, most of them still rely on 3D training samples over 2.5D annotation to initialize all constrained models. So then it comes to a question that can we train a model to get 3D representation with only accessible 2D annotation. To this end, we utilize multi-view data during training stage. Um, but different ways previous work, we try to discover 3D geometry representation in latent space of a novel view synthesis framework. Then if we can get pure 3D geometry representation in latent space, we can directly forward the representation to a shallow network to regress 3D pose. And mapping this representation to 3D pose will be much easier than image or 2D coordinate as input. But we got a new question. How to guarantee only 3D geometry information and the rest to diverse data? To this end, we propose two new models in, in novel view synthesized framework. Here we show the overlaid pep, pep of our work. Uh, the first module uh, to solve the latent space disentangle problem, we random sample two view of same subject to generate the one from the other, but instead of generate on image level, we propose to use 2D skeleton maps. And since skeleton maps only contain low frequency information when regarded as the image, so uh, a simple pixel-wise reconstruct loss is enough to surprise the training, and this module could guarantee only post-related representation is learned in the latent space. But so far, the latent code of all models are not guaranteed to have physical meaning. Therefore, we assume that there is, exists an inverse mapping between source and target domain, and the two latent codes of the two domains should be same geometry representation under what coordinate. Therefore, we propose a representation consistency co constrained to the 
framework, and we Im implement it by a bad direction, encoder, decoder um, framework, and uh, synthesize the two domains at the same time. As a result, feature of implausible forces could be detailed. Once we learn representation, we could use a simple two-layer fully connected network to regress the final 3D, 3D pose. And here we show some results. As shown in the slides, these two FC architectures could achieve reasonable 3D post estimation results. And the figure on the left bottom of the slides shows that this representation could preserve the property of robust to different amounts of 3D training samples. And for the closed data size testing, we show that our learned 3D geometry representation is robust to the cases with significant domain shift. And all representation could also be used as a robust 3D final information to current state of art methods. As shown in the figure, our model have achieved 10% and 7% improvements of two state of the art methods. Um, and please visit our poster and the project page for more detail. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Iksan, and today I will present our work on 3D human post estimation enabled by new intermediate representation. This is a joint work with my colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics. We present a method that achieves state-of-the-art monocular 3D human post estimation on individual images. A common problem with training a predictive model for 3D human post estimation is training data, which is typically recorded in a controlled studio setup leading to a generalization problem on individual images. Obtaining 3D annotations of outdoor images is challenging since most of the motion capture systems are not portable. In contrast, it is much easier to annotate a large scale image corpora with 2D pose information. Several 3D pose estimation methods in the past therefore use 3D and 2D training data together. Because of this, some of the existing methods resort to either uh, transfer learning, 2D to 3D lifting, or weak supervision. We present a new method that can be trained on large scale 2D in the world data and scarce 3D data. To this end, we propose a novel CNN architecture with an explicit intermediate representation and a learned camera projection model. The overview is as follows. Our network is trained in two stages. We first pre-train our network to predict 2D human posts on individual images. Due to the similarity of the 2D and 3D post estimation task, transfer learning using a network pre-trained on the individual images with 2D labels can achieve better results compared to other methods trained only using 3D labeled data. The problem with common transfer learning approach is that there is no way to ensure that pre-trained models can be re uh, retained during fine-tuning. Instead, we propose to fine-tune our 2D pre trained network to jointly predict the 2D and 3D pose by lifting the 2D output into the 3D space using both 3D labeled data and 2D only labeled in the world data. However, uh, this lifting upload, uh, approach is still inherently ambiguous as there exist multiple possible 3D solutions for a given 2D pose input. Here, instead of simply lifting the 2D pose to predict 3D pose, we also introduce a contextual feature to ensure that the depth information can be retained. To further improve the method, we introduce a simple network that learns a weak perspective camera model to project the predicted 3D pose back into the 2D space. This allows the network to be trained on individual images to predict 3D pose even when the 3D uh, label is not available. In summary, uh, our novel network architecture allows end-to-end -end training that combines transfer learning, weak supervision, and 2D to 3D lifting into a unified framework. We now show some examples of qualitative results. 
here we show our results on different background variation, such as uh, studio images with green screen, similar to standard training setup. Studio without green screen that has significant domain shift from the training set. And outdoor images. Our ablation study shows the contribution of each component of our proposed model. We use a direct 3D post regression method pre-trained under 2D labeled in the world images as a baseline. Each of contribution which allow us to train our model additionally on large scale 2D data further increase our performance. Our full model achieves uh, our full model achieves state of the art result on MPI in 3 HP, which contains in the world test image sequences. We now show more qualitative results. Our method also work on in the world low resolution images with various kinds of challenging poses. Thank you. Hi, I'm James and I'm presenting Slim Dense Pose, Swifty Learning from Sparse Annotations and Motion Cues, a joint work with Natalia Neverova, Risa Alpkula, Yasunas Kukinas, and Andrea Vidaldi. Unfortunately, Natalia cannot be here because of visa hurdles. So the dense pose task was introduced by Gula et al. last year. It aims to capture the geometry of people by mapping image pixels to coordinates on a 3D model. This gives a detailed understanding of pose and has since inspired other work on image understanding, image generation, and model fitting. Dense pose is a powerful image representation, but learning it requires collecting a large number of manual annotations. As seen in the slide, each person is marked with parts and around 100 key points by human annotators, requiring at least two minutes per person. In this work, we want to reduce the burden of obtaining these annotations. To this end, we present two ideas. Annotate in a smarter way and use free supervision based on motion cues. First, we study how much and what to annotate. Here's an example of a full set of annotations, all the points in all the frames. An alternative is to annotate a subset of the images or we can annotate fewer points in all images. Or perhaps we can just use the traditional joint annotations. Empirically, we find out that the best option is to annotate all the images in a sparse manner. In fact, we show that with just 20% of point annotations, we approach the accuracy of the full dense pose. The same can be seen here qualitatively. On the top, we show the dense pose predictions overlaid on a test image. On the bottom, we use the UV predictions to map the texture back to the 3D model. From the left to right, we show the effect of increasing the number of the density of point annotations in the training set. And as you can see, with just 20% of annotations, we already capture the geometry very well. As we have indicated before, annotating fewer images is detrimental, but we can multiply our annotations for free by using motion to propagate labels between frames. This is shown in the figure where optical flow is used to map annotations from the first frame to the second frame. However, this still requires having one annotated frame. The alternative is to force the equivalence of predictions across corresponding points. And then this no longer requires any ground truth. When it comes to measuring motion, the first option is to use videos and a state-of-the-art method to extract correspondences. In our work, we experiment in particular with the FlowNet2 architecture an established approach for optical flow estimation. The alternative, which has been explored in several recent papers, is simply to apply synthetic transformations to the images. The advantage of doing so is that it avoids the complexity of estimating optical flow, and it does not require a video. The disadvantage, however, is that the motion is synthetic, therefore not representative of real-world motions. We compare these two options to find out which is the best for the task of dense pose. In order to explore the importance of motion in understanding people, we also introduce a new data set called Dense Pose Track. This builds on Pose Track, augmenting it with Dense Pose annotations in a manner consistent with the original Pose Track protocol. 
The training set contains more than 8,000 instances and 800,000 correspondences. This data set is publicly available at densepose.org and comes bundled with an evaluation API, which is now used in tandem with the yearly pose track challenge. In our experiments, we show that the improvements that we get from real motion, shown in light blue, is significantly larger to that of synthetic warps in dark blue. We also show that ground truth propagation results in better accuracy than equivariance, but the combination of the two, shown on the right-hand side, is the best. In addition, we explore architecture variations, finding that the hourglass family of networks can give a significant boost of up to 2.39% compared to the ResNex architecture used in the original dense pose. Many more results are available in the paper. By combining our contributions, we can achieve a much better dense pose model. We demonstrate this by applying dense pose frame by frame on this challenging video. On the left is the baseline dense pose model, and on the right, our best model. You can see that the results are much more stable, which is anticipated given that we regularize based on motion. To summarize, our two key messages are that propagating real motion is better than synthetic warping and can be enhanced with equivariance, and that if you're going to annotate data, annotate large data sets, even if sparsely, and annotate video frames instead of still images. For more details, please see poster number 103. Thank you. All right, so we have time for some questions. And quickly, um, paper number 13, self-supervised representation learning from videos for facial action unit detection. Could you please come up to the podium? And any questions? Yes. Uh, I was wondering about the bone length model, how this would work on um, people with different proportions. So is it, is it a one model, or does it adapt to the individual person like a child? Uh, well, in our case, uh, uh, it's essentially uh, we calculate uh, by we calculate the uh, bone length by taking a random sample of the bone length that we have in the training data because there is no real real way to ensure uh, what is the actual bone length. Do you yeah, think this harms the accuracy for say like a child with different proportions? If uh, say you mean if it's uh, if the target is a child or yes, yeah. Well, uh, well, the accuracy will be a bit um, uh, lower if that's the case. But um, most of the training data are uh, like adults, so uh, it's kind of a regress towards the mean of the training data that we have. Any other questions? Uh, I've got one quick question for the last speaker. Um, you were saying something about the sparsity of the annotation. You could get away with sort of like less annotations and still get good results. Yep. Do, with the actual annotation speed, does that correlate? Like, so like if I've got to annotate 20% 20, 20 less p points, is the annotation speed 20% less? Uh, so yeah, I think it basically would directly correlate to less. Because the, the way the annotation works is that you sort of you show the annotator the point on the 3D model and ask them to click it on the image, and so that's just basically less points to click. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jia Bei. This is the joint work with Yong, Shiguang, and Xilin. Our work is about facial action unit detection. Before introducing our method, let's discuss what are facial actions. Facial actions are the movement of facial muscles. They are shown as the changes of the facial appearances. Here is an example acted by Professor Shiguang Shan, one of the co-authors. And to analyze the facial actions, the famous U.S. psychologist Ackman and his colleagues has proposed facts. They define the contraction or relaxation of individual muscles as facial action unit, uh, so this AU. Usually, we annotate the faces with AUs, and then we train a model to predict the presence of each AUs in a supervised manner. However, the annotations of the AUs are very expensive. 
And since we have large scale of unlabeled videos, can we learn from these videos? The answer is yes. Recall that the facial actions appear as the local changes of the faces between frames, and the changes are very easy to be detected without annotations. So we can learn from the changes. And we also observed that the changes are related to both the facial actions and head poses. We need to disentangle these two factors. To achieve this, we have designed the supervisory task as to only change the facial actions or head poses by predicting the related movements respectively. And specifically, giving a, giving a video, we randomly selected two frames, the source, the source image and the target image. We encode the images into some features and then we decode the features into some pixel displacement that can represent the movement. And in the red cycle, we aim to generate an image that only the facial actions are changed. And similarly, in the blue cycle, only the poses are changed. And to, make sh and to ensure that the displacement are sufficient to describe the changes, we use the merged displacements to reconstruct the target image. And we called our method the twin cycle autoencoder. And to distinguish the AUs from the poses, we add an L1 loss on the AU-related displacement to make it be sparse and be of small values. And also, because the quality of the generated images can indicate the quality of the learned features, to control the quality, we for we force the generated images to be consistent to the original ones in the pixel level within the cycle with AU changed, and also in the cycle with the pose changed, and also in the target reconstruction. And we also required the images that with the same AUs and the same poses to have consistent features. We consider the AU changed images and the post changed the image. And we trained our model on the box salib. It contains the it contains facial 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 videos with ex varied facial expressions and the movement and but without AU annotations. And then we evaluate the learned AU features on three popular AU data sets. They are BP4D, DISFA, and GFT. And here are the res reported results. F1 scores on the three data set. And as we can see that the TCAE outperforms other self-supervised method, and it's even comparable to the state-of-the-art supervised AU detection method. And here are some examples of the generated images. And we can see that only the facial actions or the poses are changed as expected. And this is another example. And we also do some quantitative and size, and this is the histogram. We will see that the AU-related displacement are of smaller length than that of post-related displacement. And welcome to our poster for the more details, and thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Stylianos Plubis, the lead author of this paper. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Imperial College London, and this work is a collaborative effort with York University. We address the problem of uh, combining 3D morphable models, and as a case study of our approach, we have built a combined face and hand model. We identify an interesting question that has previously not received research attention. Is it possible to combine two or more 3D morphable models that A, are built albeit <clears throat> using different templates that perhaps only partly overlap, have different representation capabilities, and C, are built from different data sets that may not be publicly available? Recent works that aim at predicting the 3D representation of more than one morphable model that try to solve this problem with a part-based approach where multiple separate models are fitted and then linearly blended into the final result. On frameworks, 
aim at avoiding any discontinuities that might appear from power-based approaches by fusing all models into one single morphable model. Previous approaches of head modeling have mainly focused on avatar-like representations or temporal expression mappings, which fail at describing accurately the kind of facial correlation. The first accurate head model was proposed by Liverpool York University, and in this work we combined the large-scale face model in order to enrich and extend the already proposed head model and showcasing our approach of combining 3D morphable models into one single representation. We propose two methods. The first approach approximates the full head shape from partially observed data. In, this, in the first stage, we synthesize data directly from the latent space of the head model, and we learn a regression matrix by solving a linear least square problem that maps and predicts the shape of the cranium region for every, any given phase. In stage two, given the parcel of geofacial data, we utilize the learned regression matrix to construct new full head shapes. We discard the facial region of the full head instance, which has less detailed information, and we replace it with the registered face, which holds greater detail. In stage three, we apply a final non-rigid ICP step between the merged meshes and our final head template, and we perform PCA on the final deformed meshes to acquire new gener a new generative full head model that exhibits more detail in the face area. Our second approach constructs a combined covariance matrix that is later utilized as a kernel in a Gaussian pro process morphable model. For each one of the three DMMs, we know the principal eigenvalues, hence we build the, the covariance matrix of each model. We non-rigidly register all mean shape messes along with our head template. For each point pair of our template, depending where it lies, we identified its exact location in the mean head mess or face mess in terms of barycentric coordinates. Each possible vertex pair in between the triangles has an individual covariance matrix. Therefore, we blend those local covariance matrices to acquire a final local covariance matrix. Once we calculate the entire joint covariance matrix, we're able to sample new instances from a Gaussian morphable model. Our results show that our combination techniques yield models that are capable of exhibiting improved intrinsic characteristics compared to the original head model. The resulting three DMMs capture all the desirable properties of both models, such as the high facial detail and the full cranial shape variations. Based on the demographic specific facial models, we're able to define a variety of bespoke head models tailored by age, gender, and ethnicity, as it can be seen in these videos. Leveraging the already learned head model, we are able to retrieve full head instances from unconstrained single images. Here we saw example reconstructions from a wide range of in-the-world images. First, we fit a facial mesh, and then we detect ear landmarks that help us estimate the full head shape. As we can see, our method is capable of recovering pleasing and realistic head shapes in combination with expression and identity variation. We would like to see you at our poster session. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zheng Feng from the Institute of Auto Machine Chinese Academy of Sciences. Today, my presentation is boosting local shape matching for dense three-dimensional phase correspondence. This issue is fundamental in the field of three-dimensional facial analysis. It's similar to the landmark correspondence. However, there are some differences. This time, we aim to establish correspondence between a large number of vertices that are adequate for a detailed description of the whole facial region. We aim to align both global and local structure of faces. Some of the challenges of this task include Unlike, first, unlike landmark correspondence, the correspondence of vertex on smooth region of the face neither has solid definition 
nor can be manually picked up by human. Second, the rigid restriction process can sometimes be modeled as rigid rotation and translation, but there is more free parameter to solve for the non-rigid case. So there is a question, if we treat that each vertex held a different local individual transformation, what constitutes such reasonable transformation? Our experiences are, first, the reducing areas should, should be in a decreasing trend such that two faces can match each other tightly. Second, the landmark should be in exact correspondence, and this guarantees analytical correspondence and to preserve the global structure of human faces. Thirdly, the neighboring vertex should have similar local transformation such that coherent local motion is guaranteed, and this preserves the common local structure of human faces. Our idea is motivated by the process of welding a sheet mask on a face. We shoot the mask as a template and the face as a target. The process is first match the sense all scans and then message to scratch out the air bumble. It is an analogy to the non-rigid reduction process. We can first reduce the, the landmarks and then boost local shape matching gradually. We formulate the correspondence problem as that each vertex held a different individual local rigid transformations. The width for each local transformation is, is inversely proportional to the distance to each specific landmark. In this way, the neighboring vertex hold similar local transformation such that coherent local motion is guaranteed. And also for a specific landmark, the weight is infinity as the denominator is zero. Uh, so landmark correspondence is also strictly guaranteed. For the correspondence of landmark, we all adopt a strategy of cascade iterative closed point algorithm with Gaussian reweighting. The weight for the Gaussian is decayed gradually to finally match the local fine details. In this example, the nose tip is accurately matched as the weight decayed gradually. Only using landmarks is not enough to match two shapes tightly, so we increase the number of landmarks, which we named seed points here. The seed points are adaptively increased in regions with large reducing area, and in this way, we match two faces tightly, and also we only use sparse seed points instead of all the points, and this may accelerate convergence. Uh, to evaluate the result, we show a texture transfer example. Uh, the, here are three different faces. We combine different shapes and texture. It shows that relatively synthetic faces are obtained. Uh, this indicates that the most prominent feature of the face, especially the sense organs, are well matched. We also show the topology of the matched face. The similar local Merge structure shows that we achieved a coherent local motion. We also extend the proposed method to faces with large expressions. See the bottom figure. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Can we get the other speakers on the stage? Are there any questions? Questions from the audience? Okay, I have a question for the last uh, speaker. Uh, you have cases where uh, you have so, such deformation that uh, local points will actually end up collapsing, and how do you recover from this? So for uh, example, you can imagine that yeah. over here, uh, uh, you, I will have a fold and things will collapse. In our method, uh, we match a local patch instead of an individual point. I, I think this is... Uh, shows the method may be robust to some high free frequency noise. So I think uh, we can achieve it. But, but, but actually this is not noise. What if the local patch kind of disappears? How, how big are those patches? Uh, uh, empirically, we choose patch to about two to three uh, centimeters. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's pretty much your resolution? Yeah. Okay.
Any more questions? Okay, then uh, let's thank the speakers. And as we're starting the last set of uh, speakers uh, for today, uh, please, when the speakers uh, uh, are finished, please stay for the question answer period. Please do not walk out. Thank you. Okay, hello, I'm Dominic from Heidelberg University. And this talk is about unsupervised part-based disentangling of object shape and appearance. Within a set of unlabeled images of an articulated object category, there's a lot of variability. There are many degrees of freedom. Our goal is to develop an unsupervised method by which we can learn a representation of the object category and its variability. What exactly do we mean by variability? Let's develop an intuition by looking at the local neighborhood of a sample. The most ele elementary ways in which the object could change are local changes in shape, such as the movement of an individual object part, for example, an arm or a leg, and local changes in the appearance of an object part, such as, for example, the legs or the upper body. This intuition helps us to address the challenge of representing the large variability of the object class by breaking it down into these simpler elementary variations. In order to represent these elementary variations, we need to learn a consistent representation of the structure of the object class with the granularity of parts. Then, with respect to this consistent frame of reference, the variability can be represented by disentangling shape and appearance of each part. But how can this be learned without supervision? As just motivated, we group the underlying factors of variation of the object class into shape and appearance, which are in turn represented on a past-based level. So each part has both a shape and an appearance component. We model part shapes as heat maps, and part appearances are modeled as abstract vectors. But how can we learn them without supervision? Both shape and appearance representation form the latent code of an autoencoding framework. But instead of encoding shape and appearance on the original image, we do the following. Since appearance should be invariant under changes of shape, we encode the appearance representation on a spatially transformed image. For the transformation, a TPS warp can be used, or in the case of video data, another frame from the same video. Similarly, the shape representation should be invariant under changes of, of appearance. Therefore, it is encoded on a color transformed image. Apart from these invariances, we also enforce that the shape representation should transform equivariantly under spatial transformations. So a simple example is if the image is rotated to the right, we know that the shape representation should ro rotate in exactly the same way. Okay, this was a rough outline of the method. Let us now take a look at the results. Um, here we see a subset of the learned part shapes which meaningfully represent the shape of the object category and capture semantic correspondences between different object instances. The representation of object shape can thus be used for unsupervised landmark discovery, and this works for a variety of different object categories. The method also lends itself for unsupervised shape and appearance transfer. For a holistic transfer, part shapes are encoded on a set of target poses, and appearance is encoded on a set of target appearances. The resulting rows show the transfer of appearance to the target poses. Remember that both shape and appearance representation here are learned without supervision. Since our representation is part-based, we can also transfer appearance on the level of individual parts. Um, we can transfer the appearance of the head, the upper body, the legs, and the feet. And here we change the part appearances all at once, um, while shape can still be altered. OK, so let us, let us now take a look at the video transfer. Uh, in the top image, we see 10 part shapes, which are encoded from the bottom frame. And by combining the shape representation with an appearance encoding from a different video, we can generate a smooth appearance transfer video. And remember again that here both the shape and the appearance representation are learned without supervision.
Okay, so in conclusion, uh, the presented method allows us to discover semantic correspondences, disentangle shape and appearance, and we can even do a part-based appearance transfer. And if you have further questions, you can come to our poster. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dong Lai Xiang. Given the monocular input video of target person, we propose the first method to capture his total body motion, including his body, hands, and face. This video shows our result with the monocular input video on the left. Human use their body pose, hand gesture, and facial expression in an organized way for social communication. An artificial intelligence needs to capture all those information together to understand human social signals. There is previous work on capturing human body, hands, and face, respectively, but they were treated as separate problems. Some previous work enables total body capture, but only in a multi-camera studio. No previous method allows total capture from monocular videos so that we can build a large human motion corpus from internet videos. Given an input image of a person, uh, a straightforward idea is to directly regress his 3D joint coordinates with a neural network. However, heat map representation has been extremely successful in previous methods of human pose estimation. Inspired by this idea, we also embed the 3D skeleton in a heat map representation. For a particular bone in the skeleton hierarchy, we define its orientation as a unit vector from the parent joint to the child joint. This factor is embedded in a three-channel heat map in the pixel regions of that bone. We call this representation part orientation field. It is also used in a very recent literature by Luo et al. Using the predicted heat map and 2D key points, it is possible to reconstruct 3D skeleton by intersecting the rays and orientation. However, due to the noise in the network output, the result can be quite unstable. For this purpose, we make use of a deformable human model called Adam that has the expressive power for motion in body, hands, and face. This is formulated as an optimization problem to minimize the difference between the model and the image measurement in both bone orientation and two key points. The pose and shape prior embedded in the deformable human model improves the robustness of our output. Adam model also allows us to capture total body pose in a unified framework. For hands, we train another convolutional neural network to regress the heat map and 2D key point. For foot and face, we use 2D key points provided by open pose. A cost function for each body part is added to our optimization objective to infer total body pose. This produces frame-by-frame -frame results for our monocular input video, which suffers from motion jitter due to a lack of temporal constraint. We propose a method to apply temporal consistency in our results. The basic idea is to enforce the consistency on mesh texture for every vertex across frames. As shown by the video here, this method effectively reduces motion jitter. More detail about our approach will be explained in the poster session. Using a multi-view system at CMU called Panopta Studio, we built a new 3D body and hand data set. It is publicly available on our website. Now we show more motion capture results on various in the wild monocular videos from the internet. As shown in the video here, our method can successfully capture the motion in body, hands, and face. Notice that we show reasonable output from side views and top views. Our output captures the personal style of the speaker, including facial expression and hand gestures. Our method can successfully capture human motion from a number of in the wild scenarios. Here, we show our results on a freestyle soccer player, and here a, lift weight, a weight lifter. We show the result on a mime actor. Notice how he uses his arms, hands, and facial expression in a uni uniform way, and our method captures this information together. And similarly for our conductor.
our motion capture output is compatible with usual animation softwares in the graphics industry. In this video, we show our result retargeted to an avatar in Unity 3D. Thank you for your attention. Welcome to our poster for discussion. Hello everyone, my name is Georgios Pavlakos, and today I will present our expressive body pose work. This uh, work was performed with my awesome co-authors at Max Planck Institute under Professor Michael Black. So, in this work, we are given a single image of a human, and our goal is to estimate the 3D pose and shape for the full body, the face, as well as the hands, in a unified manner. Previous methods have addressed each part of the body independently, or required sophisticated setups with a large number of cameras to enable holistic capture. In this work, we estimate pose and shape for body, hands, and face together, while requiring only a single RGB image as input. To achieve this goal, we first need a realistic 3D model of the body that is able to represent the complexity of human hands, faces, and body poses. Current models include only the body, include body and hands without the deformable face, or model all parts together, but are a result of stitching them, leading to non-fully realistic results with artifacts. To address this, we we use a large corpus of 3D scans to learn a new, holistic body model with a deformable face and articulated hands. We call our model Simplex, standing for Simple Expressive. Simplex is based on Simple, retaining all the benefits of the original model. Compatibility with graphic software, simple parameterization, small size, efficient, differentiable. Given our Simplex model, we formulate a method to estimate the model parameters directly from RGB images. Our method is based on Simplify, and we call it SimplifyX. Similar to Simplify, we first detect 2D key points bottom-up and then fit Simplex to them in a top-down manner. Simplify X improves Simplify in all directions. Our more expressive Simplex model pushes us to go beyond the body-only joints used by Simplify. To this end, we rely on an updated off-the-shelf 2D pose detector that can detect hand and face key points which enable expressive captures with a level of detail that was not possible before. Moreover, we use a better body pose prior, which we learn from millions of body pose examples. Our prior is based on a neural network, and more specifically, a variational autoencoder. The learner presentation of this VAE is a low dimensional space of valid body poses. At test time, we optimize over this latent space, and we use a quadratic penalty on the latent representation, which encourages the recovered poses to remain on the manifold of valid poses. Even with a good pose prior, though, the recovered poses can still include self-collisions and interpenetrations of the body parts that are physically impossible. To avoid these problems, we employ interpenetration penalty, which is based on detailed collision-based model for messes. Our formulation is explicitly differentiable and more accurate than the capsule approximation of Simplify. Finally, we also train a gender detector to automatically estimate the gender of the person in the image. Fitting a gender-specific model to 2D evidence leads to more accurate and detailed reconstructions than using a gender-neutral model. So our complete optimization objective includes a reprojection term, which encourages that the projection of the 3D model joints agrees with the detected 2D key points. We use pose priors for body, hands, and face, priors for the shape and the expression parameters, and finally, the interpretation penalty to avoid collisions on the mesh level. Our complete fitting pipeline is implemented in PyTorch, leading to an eight-time speedup over the original Champa implementation. Besides our Simplex model and the SimplifyX method, we also contribute a dataset to enable evaluation of our expressive capture. We create this dataset by aligning Simplex, Simplex to detailed 3D scans and carefully curating to select a set of 100 accurate alignments with diverse body pose, hand pose, and facial expressions. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, this, uh, we call our dataset EHF, standing for expressive hands and face, and this is the first dataset including pose and shape ground for body, hands, and face together. To demonstrate the importance of more expressive models, we fit different variants of simplex, that is, without expressive hands and or face. As expected, more expressive models lead to more accurate and detailed reconstructions, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Holistic fitting can also improve over part-based approaches, which, in, uh, which model the hands or the face independently. Here, we compare with a hand-only approach of Pandeleris et al., which also uses hand key point detections. In case of good detections, both methods perform well. However, when the detections are noisy, the hand-only approach can fail. In contrast to that, holistic fitting can benefit from the context of the human body and improve reconstruction for these challenging cases. This finding extends also to head-only methods. Here, fitting the flame head model 
to facial landmarks can be inaccurate or fail completely, as is the case in the last row, while Simplify X can still include, uh, provide reasonable reconstructions. We make our Simplex model, the Simplify X code, and the EHF dataset publicly available. Please come to our poster, one, number 109, to learn more details about our approach. Thank you. All right, so before everyone takes off, um, we have time for questions. So please stay seated while the questions are in process. All right, I have one quick question for the last speaker. Um, so you made a determination between um, gender classification, so like male, female. Are there other demographic breakdowns that help, like say, like, like say age, for instance, or the, other things like that that would, that would help? So we haven't explored this, but this should definitely help. So the, uh, our model captures specific demographics, for sure, like you know, probably not kids are not model because we don't have scans of kids. But uh, if we have uh, this particular model, at least, there are other models for that. But if we have other information, this should definitely be helpful for uh, our approach. Right. I think we have one question over here. Yeah, I have a, uh, sorry. Is this on? OK. Uh, for the last speaker as well, uh, I think there was one slide where he said that uh, mm -hmm. as the model becomes more expressive, uh, the, the 3D model itself also becomes more realistic and accurate. How do you really define you know, more expressive? And uh, if you can elaborate more on ex exactly why it becomes more accurate. Uh, so more accurate, we have like ablatives in the uh, paper as well, so you can see that uh, when you uh, can model the, uh, the, uh, the hand gestures or the uh, facial expressions, you can also use leverage these key, key points that you can uh, uh, extract from uh, typical CNNs, and you can have more accurate uh, fitting on your images. So in terms of accuracy, this is how you can uh, leverage more, uh, more expressive models. Great. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker and this session's closed.